especially when I bring in another horse into the herd who does not have social skills, the necessary social skills, um, they can kind of teach them. It's really nice to have like a core herd that has um, established social skills and the, and then when you need to bring in a new member that doesn't, they can kind of educate them and teach them. So that is really helpful. Um, but it's again, not always possible to achieve this. So when you can't achieve this, maybe your horse is the one that doesn't have social skills and your the other members at your facility, the barn are like, you know, your horse is aggressive or, you know, they're doing this stuff and it's making, pissing my horse off, you know, like all this stuff. And they don't want to have their horses with your horses. there. I'm glad you're back for another episode of the TWE podcast. If the audio is a little bit off, I apologize. I'm usually driving in my car when I record these episodes, so I try and keep them as clean as possible, but sometimes I can't help it. (laughs) Hopefully this episode is really helpful and inspires either um, questions or just a thought process. And I would love to hear back from you about how this podcast episode or my podcast episodes in general have impacted your life and your relationship with your horse. If you feel like you'd like to share, you can always check out more information about the willing equine on my website, the willing equine.com, where I talk about different things on my blog. I share about my social media platforms, and I also offer training services and things like my foundation foundation course, which runs every three months. So if you'd like to learn more, head to my website. Otherwise, keep listening or actually, you know what, wait till after the episode to check out my website um, because I would love for you to listen to this episode and I'd love to hear back from you on it. So keep listening and I hope you enjoy. So I want to talk a little bit about aggression and just normal social dynamics within a horse herd. And particularly we're gonna be talking about the domestic herd, Um, but obviously this can't really be talked about without talking about um, the feral herds. So I have read and have been reading and have studied the dynamics of feral herds throughout the last many years. uh, And I've been just kind of watching my own herd and exploring different options of ways I can set up their environment, ways that I can work with introducing horses to each other and, you know, the number of horses within our herd, just all the different possible variabilities that go into maintaining a herd of horses in that social environment and like how much aggression and, you know, Um, antagonistic behavior between domestic horses is normal and what is it like compared to what people have studied in feral herds. So if you haven't read the book, um, Horses in Company by Lucy Reese is a really good book. It's a little bit challenging to get through, so I'm just going to put that out there as far as it's not the most, you know, it's not like you're reading a novel, right? It's got a lot of just, it's her observations, it's her studies, it's her of retelling of stories of what she's experienced while spending tremendous amounts of time with many, many different herds of feral horses throughout the world uh, and, and retelling basically their behaviors and what she's observed and she's documented it and she's t- she studied it uh, she's an ethologist and this is what she does it's very very interesting to read her observation uh, her observations about feral herds and how they compare to domestic herds and one of the biggest observations the biggest takeaways um, from that is just how how little aggressive behavior, how few aggressive behaviors, how peaceful the feral herd is. There really isn't this romanticized, you know, stallions fighting each other out, duking it out to the death kind of thing that we see on TV and have always kind of been led to believe. And then also this highly, um, socially strict environment that foals are, you know, are supposedly raised within where there's the, the dominant mare, the, the alpha mare, the lead mare and the lead stallion. And they correct the younger ones that are out of place and, 
you know, this whole dynamic that creates this hierarchy, this hierarchy of which horses are in charge and which are further down the line, um, th that really doesn't exist in a feral herd like we've been led to believe previously. And that was just old research, old studying that now has basically been debunked. And you can read a lot more about different studies about this and the different research on a blog article I wrote called Dominance and Leadership. It's on my website, thewillingequine.com forward slash blog. And I, I link a lot of studies to that and share a lot of information from different sources about dominance and leadership within the herd and with horses in general, and then also with how that pertains to the human horse relationship. So I'm not going to spend too much time on it here in this podcast episode, but I will talk about what Lucy shares about how really the stallion um, is kind of an outliner as far as he he is involved in the herd, but his he tends to have more of a, an observing post, meaning he kind of sits on the outside a little bit and he observes and, and keeps watch and, and protects the herd from, um, or yeah, he's kind of this like, I, I don't know what it's called, but when, when there's the there's the, I don't know, there's a word I'm thinking of, but it's too early in the morning. I can't think of it anymore. Um, anyway, so he kind of watches for predators or also other stallions that could be coming along to kind of try and take his band. So there's the stallion, but the stallion doesn't really do a whole lot as far as like, they're not running around correcting colts and keeping everybody in line and all that. And, and Another really interesting observation was that I, a lot of times I think we're led to believe that the stallion is constantly like keeping the mares in check and like keeping his band together. But a lot of Lucy's observations indicate more that the mares choose to be with their stallion, which I find super interesting when they can have um, multiple bands all collected together. And when the stallion decides to start moving and or when, you know, a situation comes up where all the bands, instead of being in a mass collection, they separate into their individual bands, which a band, I, if I remember the numbers correctly, she was saying it was like three to four mares, sometimes a little bit more like four, five to six with the stallion. So it's smaller. It's not this mass collection of, you know, 20, 30 mares and one stallion. So it's, they're not all that big of a band of horses. And the mares will voluntarily, because it's really challenging for a stallion to forcibly remove his mares from a large collection of, of horses, they will start to see each other move and they will all go together and separate from the band voluntarily and go put themselves back in their own band and, and go with their stallion. And they also, if they want to change bands, which they do sometimes, mares especially, she said, younger mares uh, that that are still kind of figuring out the ways of the world, um, will change bands pretty frequently. So if they don't want to be in that band, there's not really a whole lot the stallion can do to stop them. I mean, they can, they can try a little bit, but the mares, they just leave. They just leave and they switch bands if they want to. So I find that super interesting. It's not that the stallion is this aggressive, like keeping all of his mares together and super possessive. It's that they all kind of choose to be together. Um, and I find that really interesting and something that kind of goes into how we think about horses. So I think it's important. The, um, so anyway, so the interest so the stallion's position really is taking care of predators and, you know, watching for them, uh, and, and for possible things that could go, that would be dangerous and start either a flight pattern or, um, or to defend the herd. And then also for other stallions. So that's a lot of what they do. And they do uh, when they're bachelors and stuff, which I also find super interesting. Um, bachelors are known for a lot of playing, a lot of just picking on each other and being goofy and having a good time, whereas mares are rarely seen playing. And I find that really interesting. Uh, mares spend, she, you know, really document that mares spend a mo the majority of their time either growing themselves, so eating so they can grow, and then growing their babies and nursing them. And they don't really spend a lot of time playing. Sometimes they're seen playing with their own foals a little bit, but not with each other. 
And also there isn't a lot of co-grooming between uh, mares. There's ma uh, grooming between mares and stallions. There are stallion and also bachelor bands. There's grooming between, but not a lot between mares and other mares. So I found that super interesting. And it kind of confirmed some of the stuff that I was seeing with my own herds. So that's just kind of, I wanted to throw that in there. Um, so mares oh and so then then this leads to her talking about how um the leader so we've always kind of been told that there's this one leader in the herd that the one one lead mare who starts the movement of the herd and really that's not accurate at all um any member of the herd can start the movement and it really comes down to the individual needs of the herd so what, you know, you can have a herd, a band, that's what they're called. So a band of, let's say, four or five mares. And at any given point, the pregnant mare may become really thirsty and need to go to the water. So she'll start to move towards the water and the rest of the band will follow. Then you'll have another band member who's hungry. And so they'll go find good grazing and the rest of the band will follow. Then you'll have a yearling, let's say, within the band who startles, um, something spooks them and they get scared and it will start the rest of the band moving as well. Um, and, and I find that super interesting because how many times can I say that? I find that super interesting. <laughs> it really indicates that they work as a unit. They work as a collaborative group of horses and they're very much about each other's survival. So it's not just this individualistic, it's my, you know, I'm the dominant one, you follow me, and it's about my rules, and you're either higher or lower than me in the hierarchy. It's very much about, like, how can we, as a whole unit, take care of each other? And, you know, I don't, I don't know that they're sitting there thinking that, but that's that's their actions. That's how they, they work together. And you can read the book for yourself and... Um, and, and she has a lot more, a lot more information, a lot more stuff that she talks about um, that it might be really helpful for you in observing your own horses. And so anyway, with this in mind, I, I read all this, I observe all this, and I, I study all of this. And then I take this to watching my domestic herds. And we have to take into consideration domestic herds are different for quite a few reasons. One, uh, they are forced, they are selectively put together. So it's, it's done out of man-made selection. Horses in domestic situations rarely get to choose their own band members and stay with those same band members, members, the majority of their life or choose to leave that band members, those band members to go to another one. So it's very artificial. It's very selected and put together depending on our needs and the human's needs and the environment. And, um, sometimes these bands are very small, meaning it's just literally one horse by itself or, and that's not a band, but then, you know, maybe there's one companion, one other companion. And sometimes they're extremely large. I've had, I've heard of situations where boarding facilities have herds as large as like 10 to 30 horses in a single pasture. And that's just massive. We don't, I mean, they, an individual band is never that large in the, in the wild, as far as I'm aware. Um, but there are, I did not realize this before reading Lucy's book. There are um, quite a few situations where different different areas of feral horses spend a lot of time together where all of the bands congregate into a mass big group and they only separate during when the either some of the mares are in season so they separate out their band so the other stallions don't get a chance to breed with their mares or um but there's just other situations that they might separate but they do spend a lot of time as a collective group so i find that very interesting and and so i think and I've not really been around a situation where there's that many horses in a single pasture, but you might start to notice that with that many horses, they separate into their own mini groups, their own bands. Um, and I find this super interesting to observe. I have not had that situation though. So I can't speak to it too much other than that it just seems like an overwhelming amount of horses. 
And I think that if you were going to set up a situation like that, you would need to make sure you had plenty of room so that the horses could separate out if they needed to. So that's important to kind of note there because the topic of this episode is going into aggression within the domestic herd. And so that's going to kind of play into it. So knowing what we know now, oh, okay. So going back. So with the domestic herd, some of the differences, there's other differences. Uh, the one that really is, can be problematic in the behavior of a band or a herd or just horses in a pasture, um, is artificial feeding and strict restricted feeding times. So if there isn't forage available all the time where they can move to and go to as a collective group and have access to, uh, and it's just available like once or twice a day, throwing out a couple flakes of hay and some grain. This can change the behavior of the horses dramatically, especially their interactions towards each other, because they're kind of having to like duke it out for who gets the most. And this can create an artificial hierarchy, a dominance hierarchy that is not seen in feral herds. And so I think this is important to note that when we see this in domestic horses, this is not normal for the species. This is something that is man-made and artificial and has pressured these horses that are typically uh, much more peaceful into being this way. And so that is, I think, really important to note. The other um, thing that really plays a part is the size of the space that they're allowed to be in. So the smaller the space, the more on top of each other they are. And then also naturally the fence lines block horses from escaping other horses if there's antagonistic behaviors and they just can't get away. So cornering another horse into a uh, pasture fence, um, you know, not allowing, they can't get far enough away from the other horse, things like that. These are all factors. And then the, one of the largest ones being the man-made decisions, as far as what the band looks like, what the herd looks like, that plays a massive role in how the horses are able to get along because it's just normal for certain horses not to get along with other horses. And then another really big factor here, and probably one of the biggest factors is how we raise the horses and how they live Horses that are weaned really early from their mothers, so dams, um, you know, before six months especially, but even before a year, do not really have an opportunity to learn a significant amount of uh, equine behavior and how they should act around other horses and social behavior. They have a limited they have limited exposure exposure to normal social behavior, and that is exaggerated when they are kept isolated from other horses. So the only interaction that the foal has is with its own mom, with its own dam, and there's no other foals to play with, and there's no other herd members to interact with. This is further exaggerated when the foal is weaned and then isolated into like a show environment where they might be stalled and then started their training, things like that. Or if even being put into a herd with a bunch of other foals, I think that's better than nothing. But I do think it impacts their ability to their social, their social skills, I should put it. So their social skills are impacted based on the horses that they're allowed to interact with as they're growing up. So horses that are not, that do not grow up in a normal herd environment are naturally going to have limited social skills. And then later on in life, we try and put them in a herd and there's heightened aggression or they are just picked on constantly or whatever because we're putting a horse that has limited social skills with a collection of other horses that also has limited social skills. And then that's exaggerated by the limited resources, the limited room and all of and the artificial herd companion management. And it just is a recipe for an extreme amount of aggression within our domestic herds. So... <laughs> When all of that's being thought about and, and understood, I think it should give us a lot of compassion for our horses in understanding as to why they can be so aggressive towards each other. They, it's like gladiators in there sometimes. Um, they just, they don't know how to interact with each other. They have, um, 
they are living in an artificial feeding regimen. Horses are designed to graze a little bit all day long for with food that is freely available 24-7. So they graze until their, their mouth and their systems tell them they're done. And then they rest and then they go back to grazing. I mean, horses just eat all the time. That's what they do. They eat and sleep and breed. That's what they are designed to do and survive. <laughs> um, it, it's kind of interesting reading Lucy's book. A lot of what she documents, there's it's a tremendous amount of eating some sleeping and more, and then a lot of flight patterns. So, you know, grouping together and fleeing, um, spooky things. So they, they do a lot of those things and then breeding. So that's pretty much what they do. Raising foals, breeding, eating, sleeping. And then we insert on top of that, that we want to go to shows. Oh, and I forgot a whole nother aspect to this thing, which is that because of our artificially created herds and because of the expectations we have on our horses to be performance horses um, and go to shows and go on trail rides and things like that. I mean, we add this whole other dynamic where one of the herd members leaves all the time. There's always somebody leaving. There's somebody leaving. It could be for an hour, it could be for 30 minutes. It could be for a couple of days and then they come back. That is so odd for the species. I mean, that is, you don't see that in a feral herd. So we add that in. And then we also add in the fact that in boarding facilities, horses are coming and going all the time. There's always a new horse coming in and then another horse leaving. And so the herd dynamics are changing constantly and there's never a, like a status quo. There's never, never just a normal set of herd members that doesn't change. And so this again, just adds on fuel to everything else that's going on and, and, and exaggerates or encourages really hostile behavior towards each other and they never really get a chance to just live in harmony and peace which is really what they want and really how they're designed to live so when we look at all this i think we can you know a lot of us who are living in you know if you are working out of a boarding facility or you just you have your one horse and you can't really control the rest of the herd, right? You can't control whether or not other, oh, excuse me, big yawn. <laughs> um, you can't really control whether the other owners take their horses or not. You can't really control, um, these, you know, how much your horse was, you know, how, how long your horse spent with their dam or if they were weaned properly or when they were weaned and, um, all of that stuff. I mean, we're pretty limited on what we can control in most situations. This, it just kind of, you know, begs like the question, like what, what can we do? Like, how can we help our horses reduce the, or feel, or feel, uh, um, how can we help them feel more comfortable in the herd? How can we help them feel less like they either have to antagonize other horses or that they don't, or the other horses don't need to antagonize them? Like what can we do as individual horse owners to improve this situation for our domestic horses? And I have some ideas for you. I think it's a case by case situation because there's going to be a lot of different, um, factors in your individual situation that I can't necessarily know while I'm talking in this podcast episode, but I can tell you some of the stuff that I've done, some of the stuff I've recommended to my clients and some recommendations I have. One of the first recommendations I have that helps the most, uh, I find one of the most is 24 seven forage. I know this isn't possible for all boarding situations, but the more you can work towards this, the better it will be for your horses. It's one of the most impactful changes you can make for your horses, providing them forage that never runs out and also that there's enough access to it for the number of horses. So for example, I use round bales, which isn't necessarily a practical option for wetter environments or certain boarding facilities, things like that. I get it. But for me, board, uh, round bales has been extremely useful. It's time it's decreased the amount of time I spend, um, in feeding each day and I don't have to fill hay nets every day, stuff like that. So I use round bales and I put a slow feeder net, um, around the, <laughs> I'm driving over this bridge and it's like shaking phone in my voice box. Okay. <laughs> um, 
So I use a round bale with a slow feeder net on it. And I, I use one inch hole slow net, uh, feeder nets because I have, my hay is, um, pretty fine. My hay is fine. So it's really, it's pretty easy, not easy, but it's not as challenging as it sounds for them to pull hay through a one inch hole. But if you have longer, coarser stems of hay, you might consider like a one and a quarter inch hole or a one and a half, something like that. Anyway, so it depends what, you know, what my horse's metabolic needs are as well. Um, and how experienced they are working with hay nets. When I first introduce a horse to a hay net, I might introduce them with a one and three quarter inch net and then work down to a one inch net. Even if they are on the thicker side, I don't want them to feel frustrated and start trying to break the net, things like that. I want them to understand how to use the net and I slowly downgrade them to a smaller net size as they are more um, skilled, adept at, at getting hay out of the net. But anyway, that's a sidetrack moment. So I use round bales, but if I have, I will only put, and I use large round bales, I will only put like three horses per round bale. And keep in mind that these horses live with each other all the time. Um, they are a very established band or herd of horses. They, uh, their herd companions do not come and go. And there's very little aggressive behavior within my herd. I, I rarely find bites. I almost never find kick marks. Um, it's, it's very, very low aggression rate. Anyway, um, I will only put like three per bale. If I have more, if I end up having to put another horse in that herd or combining my two smaller herds together, uh, I will add another round bale in. So I will put one round bale per three horses, but you might find that you need one round bale per two horses if there's high aggressive rates in the herd, or maybe you could do a round bale and then have some smaller square bales, um, around the pasture for the horses that get pushed off, things like that. So you want to make sure that the lowest on the totem pole, so to speak, when it comes to food is always has access to food 24 seven as well, not just the pushier ones. So that is a huge, that will cause one of the biggest impacts in your horse's herd dynamic is allowing them to have food all the time. So they're not having to fight each other for food. The next thing is space. The larger the area, the more they can get away from each other and the more there is to do um, other than be up, up against each other and fighting with each other. Especially when you're introducing new horses, you want them to be able to get away comfortably. And uh, so that's a really big factor. It'll depend on your area, how much space you're able to have. For me, one of my my smaller pasture is just under two acres and my bigger pasture is just under five acres or six acres. I can't remember. And personally, I prefer, I have three horses in each one. Um, I prefer like my ideal size pasture and this doesn't support them on grass all year round because, um, well, first of all, we live in drought land. So we, there's times of the year where we just don't have grass no matter how much land there is. Um, but I'm just talking about pure space and with supplemented forage. I'm not talking about the land supporting the horse. My ideal space would be no less than five acres per three horses. So, um, like you could, you could start cutting that down like per horse. That would be, um, what a little over an acre and a half or a little less than an acre and a half per horse. Something like that. I can't, my math is not working right now. It's seven in the morning and I'm just, the math doesn't work for me anyways. Um, and then it's even worse at seven in the morning when I haven't had coffee yet. So <laughs> that's my ideal size. You're going to find that something is more ideal for you. You may think that's really small depending on your area of country or world, or you may find that that's massive compared to your area of the country or the world. So, um, that, that is personally my ideal size. And it, I'm not, again, I don't have my, my heart, my herd's very peaceful. I'm not saying that the never and that nothing ever shows up, but it's super rare and something is very wrong when it does. Um, and so that's just a big, I think that's a big factor. The other factor is going to obviously be, um, the herd size and the stability of the herd. So members that are coming and going all the time are going to you know, like I mentioned before, that's going to be a really big struggle. Um, if you are not able to control when herd members are coming and going, like in a boarding facility, maybe there, you know, there's options like, so you could see if you could find a boarding facility where 
you know, they're, the horses are taken out less. So you're going to naturally find the horses come and go more in a show barn type situation because they're often going to shows and often going into the arena to train versus a place where there's more recreational riders or riders that are very like-minded as far as like keeping the herd established and things like that. And I'm not saying that I don't take my horses out of the herd. I do, but they, you know, they go literally like right next door to my open arena where they can still see their herd members. And I do take them on trail rides. I do go out with them individually or sometimes in pairs. Um, so it's absolutely something you can do, but I'm talking about more like horses are leaving a lot, like new horses are coming in and living for a couple months and then they leave and they never come back. And the new herd horse member comes in for a couple months and then leaves and never comes back. And that that's really tough on the herd. So if you can find a more a boarding facility that is a little bit more um, like a group of established boarders that are not planning on leaving anytime soon, that would be ideal. But again, this is an area that's going to be really tough in a lot of situations. So I don't I do think it plays a really big role, but it's not going to be realistic for a lot of people. But if you can, keeping the herd as established as possible is really, really helpful. Um, okay, so another factor is going to be social um, skills. So a lot of my herd members have been in herd since they were foals. Um, most of them have been raised with other horses and have never been isolated to like stalls and living in isolated life for so they are very they are socially skilled horses and that helps a lot especially when I bring in another horse into the herd who does not have social skills the necessary social skills um, they can kind of teach them it's really nice to have like a core herd that has uh, established social skills and the and then when you need to bring in a new member that doesn't they can kind of educate them and teach them so that is really helpful um, but it's again not always possible to achieve this so when you can't achieve this maybe your horse is the one that doesn't have social skills and your the other members at your facility the barn are like you know your horse is aggressive or you know they're doing this stuff and it's making pissing my horse off you know like all the stuff and they don't want to have their horses with your horses something you can do um well first of all i highly recommend um, side by side pens so like keeping the new horse in an isolated area um, really close near the herd where the herd can't just like disappear and leave your horse by itself, but like keeping them in, in an environment where your horse learns to somewhat coexist with this herd without assaulting them <laughs> and, um, and learns, you know, watches the herd dynamics, things like that. That'll only get you so far, but it can help. It can help really build your horse's confidence and it can just kind of set a, a little bit of a relationship up before you throw the whole herd in together. And when I bring in new horses to my herd, that's what I do. I, I put them in stalls and pens near each other and, or in a side-by-side -side pastures. And I let them live that way for a couple of days to a couple of weeks until I'm not seeing antagonistic behaviors over the fence line until I'm not seeing as many calming signals until I'm seeing them start to socialize over the fence. That's a really good sign, things like that. So um, you can also, um, one of the things I do is I do a lot of counter or positive conditioning. So I will take the horse that is more aggressive towards the other horses and I will spend time using positive reinforcement and everything. Um, I will give the herd members or just one other horse, I will give them some food on the other side of the fence line from where I am with the new aggressive horse. And I will just spend time working with that horse, like standing peacefully next to these other horses, eating, you know, the food I'm feeding them and just reinforcing calm behaviors. Like, can you just hang out here with me? Can you just, so, you know, just be chill. Like, don't worry. They're not going to take your food. Cause that's a lot of times where that aggressive behavior comes from is they feel like they're going to have their food taken away by these other horses. And that, that is something that even if your horse has lived with other horses, if they have always been pushed off of their food and, um, 
and have been antagonized by the other herd members that may cause them to resource guard really strongly because they are constantly having to defend themselves. So you're going to, it may not be that they're lacking social skills so much as that they have been conditioned that other horses are always after them. So that's another factor as well. Um, so trying, you know, to create that positive conditioning experience, like being next to the other horses is a positive experience, you know, and just building that up and making it, um, and progressing from there is really useful. And I've had a lot of really good success that way. Um, yeah, so that, that's a, a big thing is slowly introducing horses to each other, not just throwing them to the wolves, essentially, like bringing a new horse into the herd and just like, here you go, live out in the herd. Like when I say I, I recommend people keep their horses in herds and, you know, people come to me and they say, you know, my horse has been in a stall. They don't know how to live with other horses. You know, should I turn them out? And I'm like, yes, but dot, 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 like all of this, like, it's not just throw your horse out into a pasture. Who's never been around other horses and expect them to survive. Um, I find that that that's a highly stressful environment and it could backfire. It could create some behaviors that you are not wanting and could cause a lot of dangerous behaviors towards each other. So I'm not talking about doing that. That's like taking a dog who is scared of other dogs and reacts fearfully through aggression. So like a fear aggression towards other dogs and saying they just need to get along with other dogs and just throw them into this massive pack of dogs and expect them to deal with it. They will first probably shut down. Well, it depends. At first they'll probably start to defend themselves and they may start a fight, which could get really ugly and really dangerous really fast, or they may shut down because they're so overwhelmed. I mean, think about yourself. Let's say you are nervous in social situations and, and sometimes this makes you act weirdly or lash out at people because you're just overwhelmed and anxious and you feel like people are constantly judging you or coming after you. And then somebody goes, you know what? I'm going to fix this. I'm just going to throw you into a group of of, you know, a huge, uh, a conference, right. Where everybody is watching you and, and like, Oh, newcomer. And they just all like surround you and like, what's your name? What are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. Like you would just be like, Holy crap, get me out of here. And that would be the absolute opposite of creating a positive situation where, um, where they would start to learn that being in a social environment is good for them. Right. <laughs> so we don't want to do that to our horses. Don't do that. Uh, so let's see, we went through providing forage all the time, reducing the herd, you know, changes as much as we can, um, more space, um, creating positive social learning environment for the horses. Um, I know there's more, I know there's more that you can do, um, enrichment, you know, not having a boring environment. So putting out enrichment activities, um, and make sure there's enough for every horse. I, when I put out an enrichment activity, so if I have a herd of three herd members of so three horses, I will put out at least three, if not four of the same type of enrichment activity. So that if one gets pushed off, then they have another one to go to, um, this will decrease, aggression too, as well. Um, and it keeps their mind active. They're not just in this like boring environment where they're just like standing around and looking for stuff to do that can create some problems. Um, living in an environment where it's not high stress. So some facilities, some set setups are stressful naturally just by the nature of what they are. So like I've had seen boarding facilities that are near music venues, um, and it can cause a lot of stress for horses cause it's just on and off high chaos moments. I've, if their horses aren't used to it, um, you can, you know, if you're in a, in an environment where there's a lot of really aggressive, you know, intense punishment based training towards other horses that are in the herd or nearby the herd, this can really impact the herd and your horse because they, horses are very sensitive to each other's nervous systems and how they're responding and they co-regulate with each other. So imagine if that horse leaves the herd 
and just experiences this high stress, really punishing learning environment, and then is thrown back into the herd, they're still processing everything that they just went through, and they will bring that back to the herd. Now, this to me is a more minor factor compared to everything else, but it is still a factor to consider. And I would encourage you to find an environment where maybe nobody, and not everybody has to train with you. I'm not talking about like, you have to find a positive reinforcement bar and I'm not, or a, or a more, um, a, a, I don't know. I'm not talking about finding this facility where nobody ever takes out their horses and everybody trains with positive reinforcement. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just finding a place where it's not this insane chaos and horses are just being run in circles until they're dripping sweat and in a lot of fear and a lot of punishment based training. If you can find an environment where that's not happening all the time, this will greatly help your horse and the herd as a whole and reduce their aggressive behaviors towards your horse course too. And you know, this will impact you too. If you're, I've had it where for students or clients, um, being in environments like that, where it's just so opposite to how you believe in working with horses is it's just very, it's really stressful. And then that brings it to the training. I mean, how you're feeling about what's going on around you really brings it to your relationship with your horse. And so while that may not, you know, how you're feeling may not directly impact the herd specifically and how your horse's social environment is, um, I think it can really impact your relationship. So that's just something I kind of a little side thing, but so overall, I think these are the primary things that when I when I consult for people who are trying to put their horses out in a herd that have never been out in a herd or um, are having trouble with their horses in a herd environment, either they're getting picked on or they are picking on the other horses. These are usually the primary factors I have them look into and start to make changes in. Health is one more that I'm going to insert in here. If your horse is dealing with either ulcers or um, other health conditions, it could impact their behavior towards the other horses if they feel like they're having to really defend themselves um, to protect themselves from the other ones. Or if maybe they are really feeling desperate for the food above and beyond what's normal because of stomach issues or maybe they're having trouble chewing you know, the, these can also, this can absolutely impact your horse's interaction with other horses as well, as well as you. So you'll probably notice that you're in this type of situation. It's not just how your horse is interacting with the other herd members, but also how they're interacting with you. So that's another factor I want to insert in there. But when, when people come to me and for consults and you know, want, want help. These are the primary areas that we go through. These are the areas that we talk about, you know, how much is your horse getting to eat? Do they feel like they need more food? Um, how big is the herd? How much space do they have? Is there enough areas for them to eat where if they get pushed off, they can go to the next one. And there's always more available. Um, because this, this does help in restricted feeding environments where they get like, Hey, twice a day, a couple flakes, it can help to put an extra flake of hay out, but it still only helps so much because one horse gets pushed off, they eat on the other one, then they get pushed off again and they eat on the other one. And then it just keeps going. Um, and until there is no, nothing left. And so eventually horses are getting pushed off to nothing and that can cause some anxiety and stress in the horse. So, and, and pressure them to feeling like they need to kind of like push back a little bit and and protect their food that they have left from these other horses. So we're trying to reduce situations like that. And this also, when I'm talking to people who train with positive reinforcement with food, I highly encourage them not to train in the herd with food, even if it's with the more quote dominant end quote horse, the one that is pushing the others away from you. I mean, it may seem like, oh, well, I'm working with the one that will push everybody else away. So it's fine. They won't approach. But what's happening is, is that your, your horse, the one that is pushing everybody else away is being reinforced for those behaviors. So it's being reinforced for resource guarding you and the food, and it may increase their tendency to be aggressive around food. And also it's creating um, tension between them and their herd members. So it's, 
sure, yes, that you may be able to continue to work with that horse without the other horses interrupting you, but what is it doing to their relationship with each other? And what is it doing to your horse and their relationship with food in the long term? So we want, I encourage people not to do that. I prefer, like, even when I train in my own pastures, I have holding pens and I, um, I put the other members, the other herd members in holding pens and with food. So I give them something to eat on. So they're not just standing there with no food. Um, that way the horse I'm working with doesn't feel like another horse may come up and steal it at any time. And also the other herd members don't feel this underlying pressure to come and try and take the food away because they all want to train too, because I work with all of them. Um, so I just try and avoid adding to that herd dynamic issue. So these are the primary areas that I encourage people to make changes in. And, you know, you may only be able to make a change in one area for now. And then in a couple months in another area. And then in a couple months in another area. And that's fine. You just baby steps. Do what you can right now. See if you can make some changes and see what happens. See if it helps your horse. And maybe that particular change that you made didn't help as much as you hoped it would. But that's okay. Try another one. Try another one. Until you find, you know, a lot of times it's, the combination of all of the above. Sometimes it's one that's primarily causing the most issues. Sometimes it's a multiple, you know, causes, but not all of the causes. It really depends on the individual situation, like I mentioned, and also your individual horse. But hopefully you found this helpful. And like I mentioned before, definitely check out Lucy's book. It's really interesting, a little bit of a challenging read as far as like it's, I get, like I said, it's not a fiction novel. It's not a storytelling time. Um, it is, you know, research based. She does a lot of studying. So it's a lot of her notes, a lot of her findings, but it is super interesting. And it, and it provides some insight into how horses are really designed to um, interact with each other and live and how much we have change that for them in our man-made environments. And I think it would be easy to say, oh, but well, those are wild horses and these are domestic horses are different. It's interesting though, she studies a lot of herds that are semi-domestic, meaning that they are from domestic bloodlines, but are kept in an environment that is feral. So they are just, they put them out like mares and stallions together out into these massive amounts of land and they just live that way. They live as, um, as feral horses. And then every once in a while, like some of the, the colts will be taken for riding horses or stuff like that. So when we're talking about horses in particular, we're not talking about like wolves versus dogs. We're talking about just the feral counterpart of the same species, the same the same animal. Um, they are raised different and they have, uh, different genetics usually. So that plays a role. We're not dealing with, you know, really, really fancy warm bloods living out in massive herds, but there are, um, a lot. I, I think there's way more similarities than differences especially when it comes to the actual animal itself. I mean, this is why we're able to domesticate, or I don't, I don't know the, the technical definition for domestication. I know it's different, but um, we're able to take Mustangs and feral horses and train them um, because they are not so different. They are just feral versus a, a horse that has been raised in a human environment versus one that's been raised out in the mountains or whatever. So I think um, I encourage you guys not to look at them as two different animals, just living two different environments. That's what I want you to think of them as, is the same animal living two very different types of lives. And what happens when the, when the horses, you know, this is what would happen if we just turned our domestic horses out and let them be horses obviously because of breeding and stuff like that and selective breeding, a lot of them would not make it because we've bred poor quality hooves, poor teeth, you know, they're too big, whatever. So there would be some natural selection that would happen pretty quickly. Um, and not very many of them would make it on their own for very long, but they are still the same animal. They still have the same basic needs. They still have the same social dynamics. They still have the same, forage needs, the same um, eating requirements, the same social needs, the same, um, 
way of thinking, the same way of, uh, yeah, anyway, you get the point. So hopefully this was helpful. And, um, yeah, if you, if you feel like you're in a situation that is really unique and you're dealing with a horse that you would love to be in, you know, have them in a herd in a more natural environment, but you can't figure out how to help them. And it's just, you've tried a lot of things and you're just not sure. And you need help. I do offer consultations. It's, you can go to my website and go to the services page or the training page and, um, there's email consultations and video consultations for this particular situation. An email consultation would be just fine. And if you want to attach some videos of example behaviors that you've seen in your horse, that would be extremely helpful, but I am more than help, happy to help. I'm happy to help see if I can, you know, help you problem solve the causes for your horse's behavior and how you can help them feel more comfortable in a herd environment and reduce those aggressive behaviors. And I'd also be really interested in consulting at, um, if you have like a boarding facility or something where you'd love to move it to a more natural environment for your boarding clients and, you know, help them all coexist in a herd peacefully and lower your aggression rates. Maybe you are trying this already, but it's really been really, um, risky, you know, lots of injuries, things like that. I would, I'm happy to consult in situations like that as well. So reach out to me via my website if you're interested in that. And I will talk to you guys in the next podcast episode. Thanks so much for listening. If you'd like to find out more, head to my website, thewillingequine.com. On there, I have a really extensive blog. I'm a very prolific writer. And I also have a an FAQ page. And the FAQ has all kinds of things. It has questions and answers about training and about my training specifically, as well as just general about working with positive reinforcement. There's also sections on there about health and um, behavior. So all of that. I'm also on a lot of different social media platforms, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook. So check those out. And I'd love to hear from you. So don't hesitate to email or send me a message.